off off the record questions. So Doc, what, what's 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 going on? Is it is it is it going down out there? Because it's going up out here. Yeah, out there is 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 trending up. In New York and New Jersey, we're actually are we were receding and now we're probably plateauing. Um, but still, we're at a lower point of the trend or the wave than you all are out west and what we're seeing in the south. And the south is really exploding. Florida, um, around the Miami Dade County area, has some of the worst. Um, um, rates right now. And I know California is, 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 is creeping up there. Um, and then uh, Texas is another hot spot. So it's, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that the, uh, we are seeing throughout the South. Um, I'm not sure what happened in California. I don't know if people got lax. Um, but it's definitely exactly it's definitely taking up. <laughs> like you, you all are almost on the same parallel that we were on the East Coast. But you're taking back up and we're not taking back up like that. In the Northeast, we're, we're holding steady and staying low. And and the and the and the um, the riots and all that, the protests that didn't. We we're not we're not seeing any major outbreaks from any of the protests. We're not seeing any major outbreaks from any of. That's crazy, because I, when I was look, like I was looking and seeing everybody uptown having black parties, everybody was outside. I was like, oh yeah, my god. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean that there aren't people <coughs> in New York and New Jersey. Um, that are also not, you know, exercising the safest precautions. But overall, we've been able to keep our numbers down. And that's because, you know, we've been very aggressive about masking up, um, socializing, masking up, getting people to be messengers around masking up. We've been aggressive around getting community, community tested thinking through um, a testing strategy, thinking through um, case investigation, care coordination, where we do have some... Mm, challenges i'll say um in our area is around uh what we call contact tracing right for those who do test positive um to be able to to test who they have been um in the vicinity of or may have potentially exposed but so far i mean i just i gotta give it to the state the state of new jersey has done a very good job the state of new york has done a very good job we have consistent leadership at both state and county and local levels that's what's lacking in a lot of the states where you're seeing hot spots you don't necessarily have consistent leadership at every level of government and people are contradicting one another did you did you hear about the the vaccines that have been developed I just was doing an e a email with someone because um, we are one of the NH sites where they're doing NIH sites where they're doing the trial. Um, and the doctor at the hospital just said, "Can I sit down with you and talk about where we are in the trial and how we can approach this type of community?" You know that that, that conversation is going to be fraught with some challenges because wherever you have broken trust between the community and a system, um, you have a lack of. Um, like validation around the data, so we're going to make sure have to make sure uh, thorough and understand the data telling us. We got to talk talk community through this. So yeah, I'm I'm aware of the vaccine trials. Cool, cool. Um, I guess what's up, Bishop? How you doing? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So um, how's it going? I'm clear. So the, the senator's running late because, I guess, a, a baseball game with his kid or something like that. So he'll be in in a second. We can start, and then he'll catch back. You know, he can catch up, you know, or we can wait and just kick it for a minute. But can you hit him and see? What would y'all rather do? Y'all want to just go ahead? You want to call him the senator? Or, or what, what y'all think? What's his ETA? Do that's what, yeah, that's what. Go ahead. We can start. Okay, cool. Wait, let me just let me see where he's, where he's at with it. Hey, can we introduce ourselves? Are we coming in now? No, not really. We're just, um, just Mr. Dash went around and said hello. Okay, so, oh, so you're getting logged in. All right, cool. So we, we, all right, we'll wait. We'll start. So he's logging in now. All right, we'll, we'll see you there. He's logging in now. So uh, this is uh, Life After Time, right? Life After yes. Time. Yes. Right, cool. Yes. Um, life After Time meaning that... Uh, once you receive your sentence, once you receive um, what the court has established, dictated to you, you have to uh, be willing to live after that. You have to live after receiving your sentence. 
And that's going to take will, it's going to determine, take determination and being able to see into your future. So, um, today, this is the first time we're doing this show. And, you know, we have Farris, who just, yes. came, who just came home, did, uh, you know, well over two decades, decades, just came home from jail and can really explain the experience. And, you know, I've known his son for a while and he's always rep represented himself very well. I've always, you know, stood in touch with him business-wise, he's been great. And when he got home and I spoke to Farris, the first thing he started to talk about really was how unhealthy the food was and what was available to the inmates and how you come in healthy and basically sending you to come out unhealthy. And this was exactly, I felt the direction that everyone on this platform is going. You know, a lot of us talk and I thought that it would be a great time to try to make some change, bring awareness and change. So first, I'd like to let everyone introduce themselves and let's start with Faris and then we'll start and we'll just kick it about that. And we'll just go from there. Faris? Yeah, how you doing? My name is Faris Phillips. Uh, I was re just recently released from federal prison after doing over 27 years for a violent uh, act. Um, you know, from Harlem, New York. Uh, I grew up in Harlem. I was born in New Orleans. Uh, I have one son. You know, I have five brothers, two sisters, one deceased. And um, it, it was a very, I had a very, very rough childhood growing up in the inner city. A very rough childhood. My father was sentenced to a life sentence in Angola prison. And uh, my mother was a, an addict and an alcoholic. And uh, that really left me with no direction with, with, with some family members. And, uh, you know, I had a very, very difficult childhood. So that led me to the streets to uh, try to take care of myself and uh, Try to help myself overcome some of the obstacles that I was, uh, I was dealt with. It, it, pardon me, is that ringing uh, coming from you or somebody? It was very, very hard for me, you know, not understanding what my mother was going through as an addict. You know, uh, you know, once you see your mother, you know, not doing as well as you expect, you know, you're embarrassed, uh, you know, all sorts of things go through your mind. And, uh, I channeled a lot of that anger in the streets. And, uh, cause I didn't know how to deal with it, you know, as a kid growing up, you know. So, um, you know, I got involved with, you know, the street life, selling drugs, doing whatever I could do to keep my mind occupied away from what was going on at home, you know. You know, I, I just tried everything in the world to try to escape that reality. And uh, by doing so, you know, I committed uh, some of the most heinous crimes that you could think of um, during that time in the early 90s and the crack epidemic and so forth. Uh, I went to jail at a very early age, uh, about 22, 21. And uh, I was sentenced to 33 years, five years, in the state in 28 years consecutive in the federal prison, prison system. Uh, I recently got out due to the COVID situation because uh, I'm a high risk candidate for COVID because I suffer from high blood pressure. Uh, through that situation with my attorneys, they was able to give me an early release because of my high risk. Uh, I came home, you know, just about 15 days ago and got involved in uh, a program called In Arm Reach. It deals with um, kids whose parents are incarcerated. Mm. And uh, it's a very positive program. My son did the program years ago and uh, it helped him a great deal. <coughs> and, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's it's pretty hard really coming back to society 
with all the changes and so forth. But um, with the love and support of my friends and family, uh, I'm going to get through it. I'm going to get through it because I'm focused and I'm determined to get through it. Because after that type of sentence, uh, you know, most people are broken. And I know a lot of broken, you know, guys that uh, did the time I, I've done. And, uh, you know, I set some goals for myself to not allow myself to be broken or my spirit be taken. And, uh, you know, I just feel I have so much life to live and so much life to give. Uh, I believe in giving, not so much receiving. Uh, I feel good when I give, uh, not so much when I'm receiving. When I gave my time back, you know, and got an early release, I wasn't really happy for myself. I was really happy for the people that stood <coughs> by me, for the people that uh, helped me through the journey, because it was a very hard journey. And for them not to be able to turn their back on me or uh, just forget about me meant a lot. Because when you go in the system like that, it's really hard. It's really hard. It's really hard to <coughs> maintain, maintain a positive attitude and uh, stay focused on your goals. You know, I know people that, uh, you know, they were sentenced to similar time and uh, they just couldn't deal with it. Mentally, they couldn't deal with it. So they, they would act out and, you know, with stabbing people, uh, you know, going after the cops, or just doing other things. And uh, I always seen myself being better than where I was at. You know, I used to tell myself, I used to sit around the guys I was sitting around and said, I'm better than this. I don't belong here, you know. And uh, I started to see some of the uh, qualities that I possessed. So I started installing it in my son. And with that, he became the man he is today, you know. And, you know, I credit that with a lot of the friends that I surrounded him with. The Kevin Childs, uh, you know, guys, you know, other guys like Terrence Stevens, who runs In Arm Reach. You know, just positive people. And I always let them know that, you know, it's not who you with, it's who you around. If you surround yourself with the right people, no matter what you want in life, you can achieve it. You know, so, you know, with that, you know, I started developing a positive attitude for myself also. So I started surrounding myself with positive people and people that I was doing positive things. Now, you know, to overcome some of the difficulties I was feeling and I was going through. And with that, I was able to successfully, you know, uh, complete over 60 to 75 programs in the prison system and, uh, you know, just create a better thinking environment for myself and for the people that surround me <coughs> to achieve some of the things I want to achieve. But doing so, it was very hard because the system is so hard. The system is very hard. It doesn't allow you to nourish yourself. And what I mean by nourish yourself, it doesn't allow you to eat correctly. It doesn't allow you to um, to, to, to even, um, you know, dress correctly. I mean, they took the washing machines out of the prison system. So now you have to wait and, you know, be able to wash your clothes. I mean, I've been washing clothes with my hands for the last 20 something years, 20 to 15 years. And, you know, there's no normalcy in the system. You know, they talk about rehabilitation. I want to say I really don't see it in the prison system. And I've been in there for over 27 years. I, I really don't see it. I mean, to me, the system needs an overhaul because you're not getting the basic needs that a person needs to survive. It's like you're living in a third world country out there, you know, in there. You just have, the only, the only difference is, you know, you have a flushing toilet or you have in hot water, you know. Other than that, the conditions is horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible. You have people getting, uh, uh, 
what is the skin disease? Uh, scale, scalies, stuff like that, like all type of rashes on a frequent basis, and it's just, it's just, it's just a horrible situation in there. In this time and age, I don't think life should be like that. I don't think life should be like that just because you might have committed a crime and you were sentenced to a certain amount of time. I mean, we, we're still harmed. We still, you know, we still human. We still Americans. You know, we still have people that love us and care for us. You know, so it's it's, it's just a terrible situation to have to go through. You know. And the whole purpose of this platform is because we have such an authentic experience firsthand. Again, how can we fix it? Um, and we're gonna discuss everything that he just said and more. Uh, Senator, and can you introduce yourself? And and well and well said, Farris. That was off the hook right there. You 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 you're like a writer. Yeah. No, absolutely. So um, this is Eddie Melton, state senator here in uh, Gary, Indiana. Um, you know, it's just uh, it's always an honor to be among uh, the folks that's on this line, and I, and I appreciate you, my brothers, just sharing your story. And as we talked a couple of weeks ago, right? Uh, when you shared the issues dealing with uh, the lack of nourishing food, uh, the issues on how they handle or mishandle. COVID-19 in the prison system. Uh, I shared with Dame and I shared with the bishop yesterday that that inspired me to come back home and start inquiring within our own prison system in the state of Indiana. And I think platforms like this, conversations like this will help other people pay attention to issues that you're bringing up. Um, where I'm hoping colleagues that I have across the country and other, and other states will take up looking and investigating in terms of the treatment or the mistreatment of those in, in, the, in the prison system. So uh, one of the things I, I strive to do is just listen. You know, I think as leaders, that's, that's something that a, a characteristic that a lot of people don't have is listening. But once we move past listening, how do we identify what the issue is? Have a mind trust of experts, a mind trust of individuals that have a sincere desire to help uh, the people and come up with solutions. And, and that's why I appreciate Dame. He always brings together people that's willing to commit the time to come up with solutions. So I, I appreciate you. Uh, uh, I appreciate your family, and, and we we haven't known each other while, you know. Like you said, for them to hold you down, and and you to have a son that you are extremely proud of, man, that's that's a blessing, and and it's a blessing that you know to see you out, and you you being able to mentor other young men uh, in so many areas. So uh, I'm interested in getting to the the conversation as we move forward, and hearing other folks share their thoughts and perspectives. Nice. Dr. Chris. Oh. So um, thank you, my brother Farris, for sharing your um, your experience, right? It's the power of the lived experience that really uh, gives us the most authentic opportunity and window to solution. And what I know as a public health physician, um, you know, looking across the spectrum of humanity, um, what's wrong with a lot of the prison system is that one it lose sight of the humanity of the persons who are incarcerated right um, it, um brian brian stevenson talks about this in just mercy um still seeing the humanity in someone that's what allows a system when they don't see the humanity to denigrate i can give you a couple of stats each year that a person is in prison takes two years off of their life expectancy Damn. right each year takes two years off of their life expectancy, right? So it tells you something about the environment in which people are incarcerated. Um, we have over 2 million people in the United States that are locked up, right? So overall, mass incarceration has shortened the overall U.S. life expectancy by five years years that's, that's significant that's significant right where um we systems and especially as a public health physician 
assistant, a hospital administrator, we should be thinking about how do we help people to achieve um, a wholeness, right? How do we help people achieve the fullness of, of, of well-being? Um, and, you know, we can we can go into more stats. Like if, you, if you're in prison, it reduces your expected lifespan at the age of 30. So whatever your expected lifespan is, so if you're 30 years old today and you're a black woman or a black man, a um, Latino man or um, a Latinx man or a Latino woman, um, you have a certain life expectancy, right? Prison takes 10 years off of that from the age of 30. So it's just insightful. What we know, there's overcrowding in prisons, and we've seen that during the COVID pandemic, um, poor ventilation in prison, um, substandard, uh, low quality health care in the prison. Um, we, we know that the you spoke about this too, the, the food, right? The, the, the meals, um, poor nutrition in prison. Um, we know that there are there is a trauma on the mental health. Um, you know, uh, solitary confinement is, is barbaric. So solitary confinement is like torture to the mind. Um, you know, just the overcrowding itself, um, that causes uh, mental uh, trauma and mental strain. So you take individuals who most likely were exposed and you talk about this too brother Paris who were exposed to some type of trauma at a formative time in their life right right and so there's a lot of focus also in public health on aces adverse childhood events right how those adverse childhood events increase your likelihood of encountering certain negative situations as you grow grow and you 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 seek development, you seek nurturing, and oftentimes you seek them in unhealthy or destructive ways because you were exposed to trauma, right? Uh, there was a recent Zoom that we did at the hospital, and a prolific brother from the community said that violence is a learned condition, right? It's a learned behavior. And what incarceration is not doing is not helping individuals to unlearn the trauma and the response of the maladaptive responses to trauma that contributed to their incarceration. So uh, you you were able to, to, to make it out. And, and I say that, my brother, because you made it out before you physically made it out, right? You made it out mentally, you made it out you, you made it emotionally. So what we have to be able to do <coughs> is how one, how do we disrupt, disrupt the cycle um, of trauma that exposes children and exposes young persons and exposes adults to make uh, adverse choices and outcomes, right? How do we do that too? How do we reform our justice system so that it is about perpetuating justice, right? So that, that sentencing is fair, um, sentencing is proportional, um, that people are given opportunities for mercy and redemption. <coughs> How do we look at the conditions within prison, right? To um, we're, we're we're housing people, which that's what we're we're, we're we're housing people. We're we're not seeking to rehabilitate people, right? Um, and then for myself, and I challenge others in your field or in your living, say, how can I I be involved in either levers of that system to disrupt it? So uh, you know, we're doing projects. Through the hospital, we're um, looking to explore a partnership with the former governor of New Jersey. We're looking about around specific populations um, who have been incarcerated, so vulnerable um, groups such as women who have been incarcerated, who have even some worse outcomes than some men. Um, and how do we reintegrate those women um, into society when they return home? How do we give them access um, to, to benefits, benefits like you know Medicaid, to ensure that they can take care of themselves? Um, what the last that I'll give you all is we know that not just persons who are incarcerated but families of incarcerated persons um, have different outcomes right because they're exposed to different trauma they're exposed to different systems that they're now thrown into because of incarceration and so when we say those who are just as involved what what are the um the needs of, of those people specifically and, and and that's what we have to do see the humanity disrupt the systems that perpetuate um denigration of life um and interrogate how we can avail our expertise or avail our purpose um to be instrumental at, at some level of that system mm, thank you um Terrence? yes yes so um Thank you for having me. My name is Terrence Stevens. I'm the uh, president and CEO of the In Our Reach Foundation, Parents Find Bars, uh, Children in Crisis. We work in partnership uh, with the CUNY School of Medicine at CCNY. 
Uh, we basically provide uh, one-on-one tutoring, counseling, uh, mentorship to uh, children who have been impacted uh, by current incarceration. Uh, we also expose the kids to STEM, and uh, we do coding uh, classes as well. And uh, we transport the kids up to the prison uh, systems to try to, you know, nurture that bond. Um, as Ferris has said, um, a lot of the, not only do the parents suffer uh, the trauma of being incarcerated and being subjected to, um, you know, the prison system, but uh, the kids are also um, suffering on the outside. Uh, and most of the kids feel that their parents is not there uh, to do anything for them. So that creates like isolation and whatnot. And, uh, you know, a lot of the things we do up at the prison, um, I'm sorry, at the uh, CUNY University is, is informing these kids that when we take them on a prison trip, um, you know, we, we do questions and, and answers um, uh, uh, to, 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 to try to see how much uh, input that they are having on, you know, that, that the uh, impact of incarceration is having on them. But one of the things that we also do um, is try to expose them to outside uh, field trips and let them know that their parents played a role with them being able to go to a library or being able to be exposed to a, a STEM session so that they, we can kind of break that trauma of them feeling that the parents haven't done anything for them. Um, I, I, I can relate to uh, what Farris has uh, been through as well because um, I spent uh, 10 years of a 15 year to life sentence uh, incarcerated and uh, I'm virtually paralyzed uh, from the neck down. Yeah. Uh, I myself from muscular dystrophy. Throughout the 10 years I spent incarcerated, I had to be turned from side to side every two hours during the night. I had to be bathed. I was subjected to substandard inadequate medical care treatment. And um, one of the things that um, I got involved with was the Rockefeller Drug Law Movement upon my release and uh, we teamed up with Russell Simmons, Jason Farm, uh, a number of Russian executives to try and expose, uh, you know, the, um, to try to change these laws because uh, a lot of Latinos and individuals of color was being locked up with life sentences for low level non drug offenses. So I have first hand knowledge of you know what the incarceration uh, situation is, and that's why we are uh, focused on serving these uh, kids who have uh, mothers and fathers that was incarcerated. And so, um, with my relationship um, with Ferris and supporting him throughout his incarceration and him mentoring our kids over the phones and um, having his son involved with our programs. Um, you know, we really spoke about um, also the funding and, and different aspects of development that these kids can be benefiting from, um, you know, upon his release. And so I'm really um, happy that he's home and that, uh, you know, he made it through what he made it through. And uh, we look forward to um, continuing our work up at the uh, university and, you uh, you know, continuing to run programs um, for children and frustrated parents. Wow. You're a superhero, bro. You're a superhero. For real. Um, you know, I was reading Kevin Child's book, who also sort of connected me to Fayback. Um, and there was a... I'm up to the part where uh, he's getting locked up they're taking all of his stuff away. They lock up his whole family. They put him in the dark. You know, they, they, they question him. And I was just feeling the anxiety, almost like, you know, when I do a business, sometimes I feel all kinds of emotion. And I have people I can talk to about that. And, and, and when I have life problems, you know, I, I'm lucky enough to have a friend that's a therapist. And I was just like, I don't even know how I would get through regular shit without being able to have someone to talk to 
that knows how to talk to me. And this is the reason why I was like, I got to call Taj. And Taj, I want you to introduce yourself. What's up, y'all? How y'all doing? All right. I'm Taj. People call me Taj A. You're the one that's fine. Uh, I'm from Los Angeles, California. I'm a registered therapist. Uh, I specialize in trauma. Uh, my doctorate is in uh, clinical psychology. And uh, I too am from the streets. Uh, I can relate to a lot of those, uh, a lot of the stories, different stories I've heard. I've been, uh, unfortunately, I've been catching cases since I was about 12 years old. Uh, I have some experience. In the, in the penal system as well. Um, actually, the turn that I made towards the medical field and kind of doing what I'm doing now came from an instance where I was fighting for my life again. Uh, I was fighting a murder charge that they were uh, incorrectly trying to charge me with, um, which I beat. Uh, but I got to sit in the cell for a while uh, fighting that case. And uh, it dawned on me that I had to do some different things with my life, uh, you know, especially because I just had two kids. And I uh, I changed the direction of my life and, uh, you know, found, found a passion, found some direction, which is what I'm doing now. Um, to kind of comment on what I've been hearing, you know, there's trauma involved in all of this. And every level of what we've been talking about, one thing that I've heard uh, addressed is, uh, like the doctor was uh, expounding upon, is the statistic where, you know, your lifespan gets kind of cut, you know, at a certain age. Well, for people like us that come from the community, our lifespan's already being cut before we even hit the prison system. So you can, you know, you can imagine adding that on top of that, you know, as well. You know, some of us uh, that before we even get locked up have been shot, have been <coughs> abandoned, have, you know, have seen friends die in front of them, you know, at early, early ages, you know, worrying about getting shot and killed when they're supposed to be learning at school in second grade, you know, uh, things like that. And, you know, we haven't even mentioned generational trauma just from post-traumatic slave syndrome all the way to now, which, uh, you know, it expresses itself in post-traumatic stress ways, you know, so jail just adds on top of that. And, you know, whatever injustices that we're facing on the streets, you know, for people who haven't been in the system, you can imagine in the system, there's even less accountability. You know, we face a lot of the same threats inside that we do outside. You know, and again, there's less accountability. So if you think there's no accountability on the outside, you can imagine on the inside where there's just none, none. You know, um, you can't even look, uh, you can't even look a CEO in the face. You know, the minute you get, the minute you come in to processing, you know, whether you're going to the county jail or you're being shipped off to prison, the, the first thing that they ingrain into you is submission. You know, out here, what are they? What are they doing to us? They killing us. They saying, you know what? If you don't do what we tell you, you're gonna die tonight. Inside, same thing. As soon as you get there, they ain't bring that into. If you don't do what we tell you, you're gonna have a hard time in here. What was the reference? To, what was the reference to the dogs? You were saying. The what was that? The reference to the dogs. Oh, as far as uh, last night, you said head. when you oh, look at yesterday. The oh, yeah, nah. Well, uh, during my first time being locked up, when I went into process and they had put us in the dorm, this is the first time I kind of learned about you know what goes on in there and how they you know program. And we was all in the dorm, and it, they had a rule every time they entered into the dorm was you had to hold your head down and you had to put your hand up like this. You know, you had to lay down in your cot, face down, with your hand up. In the animal kingdom, that's the mission. You know, if you've ever seen, you know, if you ever watched, uh, you know, primates, you know, or even if you've watched Planet of the Apes, what's their submission? They do this. You know, and, and that's what they're doing to us. That's how they treat us inside. You know, and again, you know, you're not eating right. You already have abandonment issues. If you're coming from the community, you already have abandonment issues. The one thing I've seen with like parents that I, that I like, congratulations to you, brother. You know what I'm saying? For, for being out and surviving that. You know, but one of the things that I think is distinguishing you that has made, you know, that has helped you to become where you're at now is that you had a support system of some sort. Number one. Number one. Right. <coughs> yeah. And the thing is, a lot of people that go outside, 
don't have no support system. Like you said, a lot of times they families forget about them, especially if they wash and they do doing light, like long since. <laughs> you know, people do they're already coming in with abandonment issues in the first place. They're already coming in with attachment problems. You know, moms, like you said, like in your life, moms might have been an addict, you know, pops wasn't around, you know, so they're already dealing with these issues. So they come in there, it just gets reinforced. And so not only are we not rehabilitating this community, okay, but we're causing more trauma. And then we're, and then if they do get out, not only are their lifespan lower, but the chances of them going back in is double because now they're being re-traumatized again, being outside. So, was so in essence, what's happening is, is you know, you have like, uh, let's say in the military, you go to war, they come back, they're not able to adjust. That's the same thing that's happening to people that's locked up. You know, and I see it within myself. I too uh, have high blood pressure. Right. From, from this life, you know? And I deal with my friends and family that are locked up every single day. You know, Dave, you've seen my cousins, you know, they come home with big old things on their legs, you know? I have one right now on my leg. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So, <coughs> it makes it hard to get work, you know? You know, somebody like, like us, we're lucky. We know people like Dave, you know, we got a network of people that can kind of help us with things, but you know, I know other people who only know me, they don't know nobody else. So it's hard for them to, you know, be able to make money. They can't go outside a certain radius. You know, they, the, the, the system tells them they can't be around the people that they grew up with that love them. Like, it's, it's, it's difficult out here. And, you know, like you said, we have to change the direction from punishment to rehabilitation. But the thing is, is that the system itself, if you look, and Dame, I'm sure you can appreciate this perspective, if you look at it from a business standpoint, what motivation do they have to change the system? The school to prison pipeline, the parole system, the probation system is all geared in towards getting them back so they can put more of that money, more of that dough in their pocket. So they really don't have no motivation to change the system. So we got to change. Again, I stress support system. Those of us that's out, <coughs> we have to do the work. You know, I do a lot of therapy with my homies on, on the phone, you know, and, and show them, you know, um, um, you know, how to mentalize, how, you know, mindfulness techniques, things that will slow the world down so they can make better decisions on the inside, you know, to prepare them for the outside. You know, a lot of them not getting that in there. So it takes for us on the outside, same thing that we're doing out here, putting the pressure on the cops, you know, putting the pressure on the Karens and everybody else. You know, if you say something racist on here, guess what? Probably going, you going to lose your job. How it go? You going to lose your job? Yeah. All right. Well, that's the same thing we need to do, like you know, for the people that's on the inside. We got to, we have to advocate for them and we have to make those things happen because they really don't have the motivation to do it from the inside. And from a business standpoint, why would they? They making money off of every seat that's, that's filled up up in there. You feel me? Yeah. When this COVID pandemic happened, you know, I used, I, I used to watch Fox News, CNN, you know, world news, everything. And I was waiting for somebody to speak up for us. Because here, I was in Danbury F uh, FCI, which is located in Connecticut. Uh, they had a massive COVID outbreak. And my unit alone, I watched them take 15 to 20 people out. At night, I lived in a dormitory atmosphere. I used to hear the sneezing, the coughing, the choking of people. A guy died to me. A, a guy died sleeping like three beds next to me. I watched them literally die day by day. That's crazy. Coughing, coughing, coughing. coughing <coughs> That's crazy. Uh, sneezing. No one crazy. comes to him and helps him. He dies. He um. They come and get him. He's on the stretcher. Next thing you know, we get word he, he, he died. You know. Um. It's it's. I don't know if it's a lack of education. I don't know if it's a lack of concern, but these officers, their training, it's not up to par on what it should be. Because if you see, I guess, the NYPD or LAPD or whatever cops, they're not being trained correctly. So imagine the correction officers. 
Where yeah, the, they're trained to just break you. They, they train just not to interrupt you, but they just they just train to break you down. <coughs> That's all they, they train to do. Count. They just train to count because yeah. they don't care. When you when you yeah. come and interact with them, you can say, listen, I'm having chest pains, whatever. Okay, all right. I, I call I call I call the uh, PA, but go over there and sit down. And then keep talking to their uh, staff member or whatever on the phone. The concern yeah. and care is not there in the prison system. Yeah. Uh, I just recently filed for Medicaid, and uh, I gave the lady the little bit of information I had about myself. And uh, I wasn't used to the concern. You know, I mean, I'm a well-adapted person. I mean, I've been home 15 days at least. I mean, I'm adapted. I, 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 you know, I walk, I'm comfortable. You know, I'm using the phone, I'm comfortable. I set up the Zoom, I'm comfortable, you know. It's but a different world out here for you, so that's It's a different real. world, but I wasn't comfortable with the concern that the lady had for me. You know, I was like so thankful. I kept thanking her over and over. And I, and I, and I know she was just like, like, all right, okay, okay, I just, I just helped you. But I wasn't used to the help, you know, because even when you go in front of medical in the prison system, they're concerned and they're careless. They're not, they don't, they don't care. It's just that you're just there. You're just there, and we're gonna deal with you any kind of way we want to deal with you. Whether it's we want to give you this medication or we want to give you a bottom bunk pass, I had to fight each six months to a year for a bottom bunk pass. Because I've been shot in my back three times. And I suffered from stenosis of the back, of the spine. So you're gonna actually get, I'm a 49 year old guy, you're gonna actually give me a hard time with, with getting a bottom bump? Like, seriously, like, you know, I wake up in the morning, I'm stiff. I got arthritis in my back, I'm stiff. So you're gonna actually, if I don't fight for this, you're gonna actually put me on the top of a bump, you know, to where I gotta climb down with stenosis and three gunshot wounds to my lower back. And, I literally, and it's just a piece of paper. So some, some months I go up there, it's easy. It's a snap of a finger. Some months, oh no, Phillips, you gotta pull your file. We gotta do this, we gotta do that. And it's like, yo, you serious? Like, come on, man. Like, why I gotta go through this for a bottom bump? You know, but then, you know, uh, you know, someone that doesn't look like me or a Caucasian guy coming there or a Jewish guy coming there, like that, he got every pass in a foot. Foot pass, back pass, bottom bump. He gets everything, a fan, clippers, he gets everything he wants. And that's because, I mean, and, that's, and that's because it's that, and that's also because they fear that they're gonna be held accountable by those people. This is why we have to educate our people by holding them accountable, how to hold them accountable, and things like that. There's well, no accountability when it comes to our community, and that's a big problem. Well, you know, my thing is, right. I think it's, it's, it's that it's like a lot of the uh, prison guards it seems like they are trained to turn rehabilitation into punishment but you are already punished by your sentence you're not supposed to be punished while you're supposed to be rehabilitated but they take the rehabilitation away and they replace it with additional punishment hmm. uh bishop bishop still there yeah, I'm here. I'm okay. using a new computer, so uh, first of all, I want to um, tell uh, Mr. <coughs> and Mr. Stevens, you are my heroes. Um, <coughs> because uh, what I do in life, um, I'm into changing lives, and nobody lives their life in a straight line. Every individual it doesn't make a difference who you are. You make different changes. You make different changes from uh, being an infant to being a child, from being a teenager for being a, an adult. Uh, and each and every one of us, we've made mistakes. Each and every one of us, we come to a place where we have to reevaluate what, what we've done. From uh, Mr. Phillips, what I've heard from you that really blessed me, and I came up with this, the first thing all of us we do, we have to have a self-evaluation. And this is a self-evaluation regardless of when we want to do it. But we do this self-evaluation. After the self-evaluation, we have to come to the understanding that we might have to re-educate ourselves. Once we re-educate ourselves, then we re-evaluate ourselves for re-entry. When we uh, 
go for re-entry and re-entry can be on many different scales. Re-entry could be changing the job, re-entry could be uh, starting a new relationship, but getting an old relationship. But through all of these processes, <coughs> you understand nothing in life is a straight line and everything <coughs> in life is overcoming our failures, overcoming our mistakes, or overcoming some past uh, uh, thing that we've done where we want to move in a new direction. And then um, what I was uh, getting very heavily is when Mr. Phillips was saying, uh, others don't care about you. And what uh, began to resonate with me is when others don't care about you, you have to care about yourself so much that regardless of your circumstance, regardless of your surroundings, you have to make a change. Um, one of the greatest, well, the first books I ever read that was not a homework assignment was the autobiography of Malcolm X. And his whole autobiography is once again of self-evaluation, uh, re-education, and change. Uh, and that comes when you, each, of, each and every one of us, we take a hard look at, our, at ourselves and we say, what's going to be best for us and what's going to be best for our families? I think one of the things that we have to solve here is that we have a pandemic in the inner city. We have a pandemic of uh, people who have grown up in hurt, who uh, choose a life to hurt others, and within hurting others, they find a form of survival. But within that form of uh, survival, there becomes this uh, cycle, this cycle where we hurt ourselves and we hurt others. And then it has to come to a point where there is a reawakening. Now, with that being said, I can remember um, a while back, I was in the barbershop with a, a lot of my good brothers, my Muslim brothers. And um, what it came up uh, and what I brought up I believe that within within our culture in the street, there's a lot of forms of mental illness. There's a lot of form of uh, of sicknesses, and there's a lot of form of, of people who are afraid to get counseling, afraid to get help, afraid to get therapy because they feel it's not cool. But we find out we have a lot of uh, children who have suffered trauma, and in suffering trauma, that trauma has made them hard. <coughs> that, that, that trauma has made them hard and made them on a path of survival where they not not always have empathy for their fellow man or their fellow woman. And not having empathy, they make choices that hurt themselves and hurt others. But then uh, when they're thrown into the system, the system, the court system, into prison, we have to come up with a form of, of lack of a better word, of uh, rehabilitation and uh, breakthrough and deliverance. Because so many people are within this cycle. So many people are within this, this cycle of pain. So we need people who have overcome, uh, <coughs> such as Mr. Stevens and Mr. Phillips, people who have overcome so that we can have a, a, a map of how to overcome. I know one of the issues we definitely wanted to, to deal with is the health, the health issue. We want to deal with the health issue before going into crime, the health issue and the trauma, what Taj was speaking about, while in that situation, and then the health and the trauma after being charged, and then the health and the trauma during the time, and then the health and the tra trauma of coming home, and all of it. And this is something I believe the state should pay for, because when you are in prison, you are property of the state. So if the states, uh, um, uh, uh, it's the state's a priority to make sure that this American citizen, this American citizen is received, uh, receiving the right health care, receiving the right diet, and receiving uh, a form of re rehabilitation. And this is something that is, is, is very much needed. Uh, I'm in the field of ministry, and in ministry, I believe that everybody's life changes once they have an anointing. Uh, the Greek word is Christos. Once you have an anointing, you have a whole new outlook. You have a, a whole new a breakthrough. The New Test, the New Testament, or the New Covenant, was written by convicts. The New Testament, uh, 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 the majority of the whole New Testament, was written by eighty percent. No, no, eighty percent, ninety percent. Speak on. Speak on. Ninety-seven percent was written by convicts. I'm trying to think of somebody who didn't go to jail. So, so you you, you got to understand that it's also within these these prison terms that a lot of the, these people had spiritual awakenings, spiritual awakenings where they were able to, 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 to write inspired scriptures that have been passed on a generation to generation. So we see uh, a, a lot of times 
what others have created to be our breaking point, the Heavenly Father used that to make our making point, making us into the men and women we are today, uh, building character. So it's very important when we talk about the, the health care. Like I said, when we talk about the health care, it begins before you go in, in, into prison. It begins into, the, into that. I'm sure we can trace back and find out what was going on uh, in the childhood, what was going on in the classroom. Of, of, at what point were they no longer interested in learning? And, and once again, they might not have been interested in learning because of the home environment. The home environment could have been a war zone. So we begin to understand where there's a whole community needed and it, it is a community effort. Because if I can help somebody in my community, maybe I can save my life or maybe I can save my, my neighbor's life or maybe I can uh, save the business owner's store and so forth and so forth. Well, we see this is a human effort, a community effort, and a love effort. And that's what's greatly needed. And then, as Mr. Phillips was saying, and also Mr. Stevens, so many um, correction officers, they have the mentality that your life isn't worth saving. Because your life isn't worth saving, I don't have any need to show you empathy. I don't have any need to show you sympathy. I don't have any need to show you hope. So they feel as that it's their job to persecute those who are already hurt, persecute those who are already broken. But once again, this cycle, and it is a cycle, has to be cured. What we see in the past is that America thought, uh, well, first of all, prison is big business. Prison is big business. Uh, uh, inmates make things. Inmates, uh, they produce things. Uh, so, uh, inmates in, in certain, certain levels is a new form of slavery. And it's a whole system that supports the court system. It supports lawyers. It supports police. It's, it, it, it's, it, it's a whole system that people don't want to re rehabilitate because there's so much in business. There's certain jails that they said that to house certain prisoners cost $65,000 a year. That's a $65,000 job that they'd rather not uh, produce, but rather imprison someone and not help them. But once again, that's when we have to deal with the health issues, trauma issues, and once again, the issues that put people behind bars. And then it's the whole other thing that comes involved, children. The children suffer. The children who did not commit a crime, the children um, uh, are stigmatized. The children have a, have a harder time. So it's something that we have to brainstorm, brainstorm and come up with. Especially when we understand you have so many black and brown people who enter the prison system because of a traffic violation. So you have so many black and brown people who enter the prison system because they don't even know that they got a parking ticket. That parking ticket turns into a bench warrant. That bench warrant turns into arresting them. Oh, we can't let you out because court is closed. And then uh, being in that environment, some people have to uh, move towards survival. So this is something that we have to have to move on very speedily. And once again, I believe it is, it's all a form of life, co life coaching. Because each and every one of us, we're, we're still experiencing things that we're learning from. It's still experiencing things we want to grow from. But um, I um, am always energized when I hear how people have stopped, <coughs> um, they have taken an initiative to see and reflect and begin to say, I'm going to pick up my life. I'm going to pick up my life regardless of how many pieces it's been shattered into, and I'm going to walk in another direction. And everyone has done that in any form of their life, whether it's in education, whether it's in some form of abu abuse, whether it's in some form of failure, everyone has, has made that choice. Uh, and made the determination, even if they've made some bad choices, that they had to <coughs> come to a place where they reevaluate. Re so one of the things that I want to do is get rid of the stigma of people who need help, gang members who need help, gang members who can't cope with the fact that, hey, I hurt somebody who's bothered me. And in that, uh, in that society, it might seem like you're weak. With you. No, you're not weak. You're just a human being. You're a human being that has feelings and passions. And someone needs to, 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 to awaken those feelings. Because those feelings where some people call weakness are actually the feelings would give you empathy to save another life and help another life and to encourage someone to move forward. So once again, there has to be life after incarceration. There has to be a life after change. There has to be life after time. Uh, now, so when someone is given time, they have to live after it. Yes, Mr. Dash. So I just want to be clear of the intention of this conversation. You know, it's like, you know, checkers and chess. I don't think that the state or the government is going to intentionally help us. I think everything they're doing is intentional. And I think that we're going to have to help ourselves. 
So that would mean doing it ourselves. But until then, that's chess. But until then, we do have a senator on the phone. I mean, rather on the Zoom. And what I'd like to understand is, as it relates to these three things we spoke about, or four, and it's endless things, how can we immediately make laws to protect the health before and after? What can we do right now to help? And what are we lobbying? What should we be lobbying for to make this happen immediately? Senator. Well, I started that process in Indiana and I shared with you guys last night and I just shared this with the group. As I called to set up a meeting to go visit the prisons in Indiana, it was scheduled, it was on the books, it was supposed to happen this week. 24 hours later, I got a call to cancel. So which, which draws more suspicion in terms of what do we have to cover up? You know, what, 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 why aren't I alone? Why haven't you provided the opportunity for not just inmates, but also some of the staffers in there that want to talk and be transparent and open on some of the issues as they So I think it's clear that we know what some of those barriers are. I know it's one of the barriers state to state, but it's similar. I know what they are. I know what they are. They don't want you to see the conditions of what's going on with the COVID in there. A prison system is not designed to, 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 it's not structured to handle the COVID situation because they're not testing the police on a regular basis. They're not testing the inmates on a regular basis. Uh, when they came and test my unit, it was, uh, it was about 45 to 50 of us. They took a swab and they just hit the tip of your nose. So out of that 45 people, only one came back positive. But I'm sitting around guys that's sick, that lost their taste, lost their smell. You know, can't taste, can't smell, no appetite. And, and we, used to, we used to all laugh at each other and think it was a joke. We'd be sitting in the TV room, 10 to 15 of us, and, we're, and, and, and uh, one of the questions we're asking one another, what's up, where you at? And we'd be like, uh, like 80%. And that was how we was feeling. Some people used to say, I'm at 30%, I'm at 40 So, you know, it was like, we, we didn't have no place to turn to. And, and another thing is that when you're feeling like that or whatever the case may be, people are really afraid to approach the officers because what they're gonna do is, they're gonna lock you in a cell, right? And they don't lock you in a cell. You have nothing. They don't allow you to take anything with you, no cosmetics, no change of underwear, no change of t-shirt, nothing. They just lock you in the cell. You're not able to use the phone, you're not able to email. So your people don't know what's going on. So it was a pact with amongst us, a group of guys, and we would say, yo, if I ever get taken, call my aunt or call my father or call my sister or call my brother and let them know they just took me. And they would take you and put you in that cell and give you bag lunches for the remainder of your 14 or 15 days quarantine until you test negative. And some of the tests was, you know, it wasn't an accurate test. Some of them be default, some of them be positive, you know, was negative, you know, and it was just locking people up. So some people would just say, man, listen, I'm fighting this on my own. I'm gonna give me a bunch of oranges, I'm gonna squeeze them, put a little honey in it, and I'm gonna drink this all day with hot water. And, it, and, and that was the only two for us to fight. Federal system, it wasn't even giving us hand sanitizer. It wasn't even, I mean, we have not yet seen, and I talk to guys all the time, no hand sanitizer. Something as simple as hand sanitizer. So you got guys going to the computer, you got guys using a phone, you got guys right basically. That's crazy. I mean, the sinks are right shoulder to shoulder. You know, there's no such thing as social distancing at the low facilities. So the, the, the germs are unbelievable, are unbelievable, because everybody is touching everything. You're not locked down, so everybody is mingling, everybody is in each other's face. Uh, it's, 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 it's unbelievable what people are going through right now. And I, and I, and I pray that anybody and everybody that has someone in the system, please write to them, please uplift their spirits. 
send them magazines, send them books, send them pictures. Because what they're going through right now is unbelievable. I mean, I'm blessed to make it out. I've been getting calls all week from people, you know, congratulate me and, and, and you know, helping me and thanking me and everything. And it means a lot, but I, I don't get to enjoy it because I know what the people are going through back there. So I beg any and everybody who has a friend, a loved one, brother, sister, whoever, and that's incarcerated at this time, please, please do anything you can for them to, to lift their spirits, to hold them down, because this is a very, very hard time for them right now with this COVID system. Let me ask you a quick question, uh, if you don't mind. When you went through the process with your attorneys for early release, right. was that a strenuous process? How, how did that go? How long did it take? <coughs> Well, I was fortunate, right? I was fortunate to have two great attorneys. One name is Anthony Rico, and one name is Peter Keanu. And I also had an investigator named Frank Gonzalez. He's retired now. Um, they, they, they stuck with me through my whole process of my time. Those was one of my, those three was my foundation of doing my time. And uh, I was blessed. And I was blessed and I used to thank God for them every day because it wasn't nothing that I needed. It wasn't nothing that I needed that I couldn't get, you know. And, and that was something on that side, opposed to the family side and friend side. Um, the process, um, I didn't really reach out to them at first because I know how busy attorneys are. So what I did was I wrote my judge a letter. And I just gave him the experiences that I was experiencing while I was incarcerated there at Danbury while going through this pandemic. So he assigned me uh, a public defender. So when he assigned me a public defender, my fiance called my attorneys. And when she called my attorneys, he told her for me to contact him. And when I contacted him, he took over the case from the public defenders and uh, he pr processed the motions uh, with my help and uh, with the other attorney help and got me through the process. It wasn't strenuous, it was stressful somewhat, but I had faith and I prayed that, you know, something positive will come out of this because I have always lived since day one when I entered the prison system in a positive manner. I mean, it was nothing that could get me off my square. I mean, I was around every and anybody. I've been to Attica, I've been through eight different prison systems. And I didn't allow anything to take my focus off getting back to my family and to the people that loved me and helped me through the, the process. I felt I needed that. I felt I owed that to them to show them that I'm not this person that I once was. Right. So, you know. I appreciate you once again, uh, my brother. I just want um, to weigh in on something. Um, as long as the system of government can exert undue power and control over your life, it is spiritual, emotional, cultural negligence not to demand of the system to do right by you. As long as the system of government can define laws, can define regulations, can define uh, consequences of your actions, it is suicide not to demand of the system to do right by you. Doesn't mean that the system is the, uh, is the only way to create the solution. It means that it has to be one of the tools in your toolkit, right? So right. in New Jersey, um, New Jersey, as of, I don't have uh, more recent stats than May 2020, but in May 2020, New Jersey had the highest COVID-19 prison death rate right because of the conditions that you described because of the poor ventilation because of the overcrowding crowding because of the denigration of humanity not even giving you access to hand sanitizer right so there are levers there are opportunities to exert pressure on the system because the federal government or the state government is responsible for you while they are incarcerating 
the state government and the federal government tries to willfully and woefully ignore that, but we can exert pressure. And that pressure comes in various forms. So in New Jersey, our former governor went to the legislature um, and had a commission, had a commission developed. And as a part of that commission is a way to, uh, to exercise accountability. And because that public accountability was put before the state legislature, and because that public accountability was put before the state um, incarceration system, that there are now things that are that are in transit, that are in production to bring change. Has it changed yet? No, because government changes slowly. But it, 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 I'm saying this, and I'm saying this with this intensity, because you can't let government off the hook. If you don't, government will abuse, because government has an unequal sense of power to an individual. So I'm all for collectively us coming together. What can me as a public health physician do? What can you do as a bishop, what can you do as a reclaimed um, citizen, like reclaiming your full humanity and rights? What can you do as a therapist? What can you do as a thought leader uh, and a mogul? Yes, we have to get together and solution and brainstorm, but one of the things we need to do, we must make sure we exert uh, pressure on the system. We must tell the system where it is accountable and say we will continue to hold you accountable to do these things. Because of that pressure, in Essex County, New Jersey, the Essex County Correctional <coughs> Facility established the first ever civilian task force that wasn't mandated by law. What was the pressure that was applied? What does the that look like? Came, the pressure came from um, a past governor. The pressure came from um, activists. The pressure came from the AC, ACLU. So it, 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 the system is not going to change, and especially government is not going to change unless you go to it. And the brother spoke about Medicaid. You know, it should be easy for a person re-entering society to have access to Medicaid because we already know that your health has been damaged while you were incarcerated. If we don't do something to try to arrest that decline, you're going to become a greater cost. Yeah. So it's foolish, it's foolish, it's foolish for the system of healthcare and the system of government not to say, how do we give those who are recently um, you know, release um, back in society access to Medicaid benefits so that they can get health care. Right now, I'm having conversations about how do we care for women who are re-entering society? Who, who, what are the stopgap managers to make sure these people are connected to benefits? Or connect, and, and it's not a dirty word to have rights. We have rights in this nation, right? But oftentimes, we have to fight and we have to um, advocate for those rights. And, and I'm, I'm of the belief there is no stone that you leave unturned. None, 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 no stone that you leave unturned. And we see this from movements that have proliferated across society for years. And we are now beginning through um, our collective power, right? We have a collective power. Through our collective power, we are speaking to that system of government. We are speaking to the incarceration system and we're demanding accountability. More physicians have to do it. Right, more physicians have to speak up because of, it's a public health crisis. And what what the COVID pandemic did was shine a flashlight, shine a bright light on every disparity and structural inequity that already exists in this nation. That's what COVID did. COVID refuses to allow us to put our hand in the head in the sand and to say that we don't have an unequal and an unequitable society. That's what COVID did. So, and when you see that, you you can't you can't let up the pressure on on, on the system, whether that's the state or the federal. So I'm I'm for all tools being used. Can we uh, add on to what the doctor was saying uh, with respect to putting pressure uh, on the government? And I also like to answer um, one of the senator's concerns as far as what can individuals do on the outside to have loved ones that are incarcerated and who may be impacted by COVID. Um, you can go to your local uh, representative office, senator, councilman, explain to them what your loved ones is going through if resp with respect to their family health. Have that local official write a letter to the uh, Bureau of Prisons on the federal level because they have the power to release those individuals if they have underlying medical conditions that COVID uh, may have, you know, can be impacted by COVID. One of the things that we don't want to do is is turn their sentencing into a death sentence. And so what you have to do is go to the local official, have them write a letter, 
send a copy of that letter to their sentencing judge. If they don't have funds for attorney, the sentencing court can assign them attorney. And based on that letter, their situations can be addressed by the court. But the bureaus of prisons have the power to release them. You have to make the situation known. Get those letters in to the bureau of prisons and CC a copy to the sentencing judge. That's the only way an indigenous prisoner is going to get released under COVID-19. But the BOP, the BOP is not doing it. The BOP, the ACLU just sued Danbury Correctional Facility. They just sued them and they sued the judge over there. Because it was a it was a certain amount of inmates that filed, even myself, filed for early release or home confinement due to the pandemic. She denied every one of them. Every one of them. You can look it up. Cases out of Connecticut, Judge Shea. And the BOP is playing games. They was going so far to say, OK, Mr. Stevens, give me an address. You're going home. We're going to release you on home confinement. Call your family. Tell them you'll be getting released early. And then they were snatching it back. They did it to about 40 to 50. Look on their face. They get told this. And Nicolette. They didn't get get it snatched right back from them. Nicolette. It was really, really, really heartfelt. It was traumatizing. Not just them, but to their family members. You know, that people actually come into the prison to pick up their loved ones. And then they was told to leave the parking lot due to they're not coming home or they're not getting an early release. Unbelievable. I think we need to check the release rate of Caucasians being released under COVID-19 versus individuals of color. Well, what happened was. I think it's institutional racism. With the Caucasians, this is the systemic racism. With the Caucasians, you had pedophiles being released earlier than guys that had maybe two years. You had guys that had a date that was six months ready to leave. They had a date. But they was letting no pedophiles leave the prison system before these guys that had six months or maybe three months to leave the prison system. And those most of those guys that was pedophiles was white. Can I ask the doctor a question real quick, doc? Can you get a chance to send me some information on that commission that was created in your state? Most certainly. Yes, it was a commission specifically around reentry. So I'll give you that information. Thank you. Also, as we control the narrative, what a lot of people in America don't know, a lot of people in America do not know what's taking place in prisons. And that's become it's very important for people to hear. And another thing is that everyone has to understand is that when you are in prison, you're still American citizen. You're still American. And the state has the responsibility to uphold the Constitution and to treat that person with the decency of human rights. A lot of things that what I'm hearing here today, I've heard in concentration camps. And there has to be a parallel. The whole thing is right now, the narrative in America is if you're in prison, I don't care who you are. If you're in prison, you're guilty. If you're in prison, you're guilty. And if you're in prison, you deserve to be there. You know, I mean, I'm in ministry. I have people I deal with to tell me they don't belong in prison or their charges got trumped up, you know, and then they wanted to plead to something they didn't do. So you have a lot of people who are in prison, who are American citizens waiting to do their time. But in the process, they shouldn't be stripped of their humanity. And that's why these stories need to be told on a parallel that people are taking away their humanity and they feel justified in doing so. But this needs to be heard. But once again, I believe it's in the best interest of the state to rehabilitate. I believe it's in the best interest of the state. Otherwise, the state creates a greater bill for themselves as far as health care, as far as mental trauma, as far as revenge from a system that did them wrong or revenge that took them and kept them from their families. So these are things that is in the state's best interest. And once again, once we get the people elected who are going to bring change, we have control and power over the state. 
to implement our vision and our plan. And when you talk about the systemic racism that's within the prison system, once again, it shows how we have to become empowered to bring people with different points of view of change so that we can have empathy for brown and black people. Well, I think... So quickly, can I just follow up on one of the stats that Bishop said just to give people some context? So the Vera Institute put the cost of incarcerating an individual in New Jersey at $55,000, and this was in 2012, right? What the uh, Governor McGreevy was able to highlight, it cost $55,000 to incarcerate someone, but it only cost $2,000 per person to give them appropriate reentry services. And that doesn't even take into account the savings around costs if you give them health care and give them access to a job so they can be economically empowered. And those, so that's those, the way charges, accountability. those charges, those charges that you're uh, commenting on as far as what it takes to end to uh, to have an inmate incarcerated, those are those are also highly inflated. You know, uh, you know, it does. I'm saying it, but the point is, it, it, it's, it's, it's cheaper. It costs less, right? It yeah. would be cheaper for the state to invest those dollars in appropriate services so people don't go back to jail, right? Right. Well, the, the, qu well the question I have is, in, in that sense, is you, you guys are saying the state? You, you mean the powers that be? The state? No, the, the state, state, like the state of the state of New Jersey, right? Oh, the state. There's, okay. a, there's a cost. Not just the state of New Jersey. The state that the costs from every prison system. This right. Mm -hmm. The re that's, this is what I'm commenting on because because it's big business. You know what I mean? It's making money. It's just, it, the the human human incarceration is one of the most stableest parts of this economy. When, when there's Most a depression, definitely. when there's a recession going on, incarceration is always top billing. That don't go down. That's always sustainable. It's creating jobs. But it's needed. All that. So it's I'm, needed. Well, so, here's so, the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, we're very aware. None of these things that are being said are surprising or shocking. It just sucks that that's the normal. And right. this is the best time for there to be a new normal. Now, you as a therapist know that the reason why it's hard in therapy for black people to get therapy is because the data doesn't come from black people. It comes from people that aren't us. The people that are establishing these systems are not us. They're not going to be us. They're not going to get the data from us. So the only way is for us to do it ourselves. So. My plan and my approach, the reason for having senators on the phone and every single person here that can validate just by facts, just by facts, is for us to create the best environment for rehabilitation, make a sample of what that looks like, and then maybe it will catch like wildfire fire, or we just might have to get into the prison rehabilitation business because that's what you keep saying. If it's a business, then I can get in. It. You understand what I'm saying? Period. So when I get into certain businesses, when I get into a business like music, the problem with everyone around me was I was fighting for the artist, not for the people exploiting the artist. So if I were to ever get into this business, we'd be fighting for the people the, the, the people that are incarcerated. That's a fact. That's a fact. And I, and I love that aspect. Because I feel the, the people that's in business now failed me. I didn't have a problem with doing my time. I didn't have a problem. I, I, I held my head up and I didn't have a problem with doing my time. I wanted to do my time. Because I felt I did do some of the things that they said I did. But the system that I was released into... It didn't feel normal. It felt just like I was back on the corner of 7th or 8th of Lennox Avenue. I, I just couldn't see the people I wanted to see. But the conditions felt like any ghetto that I grew up in. It was disgusting. I'm in a TV room with exposed pipes with leaking ceilings. Uh, the showers leaking from upstairs. Those conditions was horrible. Those were right. horrible. I bet the and mold is crazy. One of the oldest facilities uh, in a prison, in a, in a federal prison system. And if you look at these conditions in Denver, 
It's disgusting, man. Like holes in the toilet, toilets are leaking. Um, just just uh, rodents running around the kitchen area. Like it's 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 disgusting, man. It's disgusting. So for me to even come back to society and and, and be able to you know sleep on clean sheets, have clean, fresh smelling clothes that I can smell a detergent in. It's, it's that's normal to people. That's crazy. But to me, it's a blessing. And I shouldn't have to say that just having a clean shirt on that smells like detergent is a blessing. You know, a blessing to life. You know, not a clean pair of uh, uh, shorts or a clean t-shirt. You know what I'm saying? That's that's normal. That's normal. And with their and how they're treating you is abnormal. It's abnormal. You have guys walking around there since they took the washing machines out. That's that's good, good, good clean cut guys, but look dirty. Why did they take look the washing dirty. machines out? So 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 when you when when the CEOs and the officers looking at you, that's what they depicting you as, and you don't want to be like this. But that's what they depicting you as. They looking at you like you dirty. All right, get over in the corner. Don't touch me. Get away from me. Not because that's who you are. But that's because of the conditions that you you tell me I have to live in. Hey, Ferris. Hey. Why, why, why did they take the, the washing machines out? Just curious. Well, don't quote me on this. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. But they said it was because of the Obama era with the um, with the uh, the Green Act or something, where they wanted to save water, more water and stuff like that, something of that nature. It doesn't make sense in that type of environment. You need washing machines. You need washing machines. You have people that don't wash. You guys come back from wreck. T-shirt disgustingly sweaty. Shorts disgustingly sweaty. Everything. You know what they do? They put it in that bag and hang it right in front of their bed. So can you imagine the stench that that's in the unit with thirty and forty people that's living in the same unit? Mm. This is why. This is why I feel it's so important that. Upon re-entry into society, we, you know, therapy is so important because I feel like by supporting these people that are re-entering into society, we're strengthening our support system as a whole to help do the things like doctor that you're talking about, you know, uh, uh, making the system accountable, you know, uh, people that have experience within the system and things like that. You know what I mean? We just have to find a way to bring it all together because there's so much to do. Well, this is, this is the way. Senator. I, I, I got another question, Brother Ferris. I, I was doing some research here in, in Indiana, and I had a, uh, a constituent of mine that issue a complaint in terms of prison switching inmates from other states. Right. Is, they, can, they I was going to ask you, right, give me an example. If you're a high-profile criminal in one state and... You, you know, you're a well-known criminal in one state, and they want to put you in another state. That's you know, that's no reason because of, uh, you know, uh, whether it's gang violence or, you know, are uh, they trying to, you know, you know, seclude you from the state that you're regularly in, put you in another state. So that's commonly used. That, that's no. That, that's federal what. Federal system and the federal system is normal. That that's what they did. The, that's what they do to Lou all the time. He's in. He's in. Well, that's in a federal system. But in the state, they does it also. Oh. Mm. But in the federal system, you could go anywhere they got a bed for you. But what I was hearing is that they're not even informing. They not, they not even informing the family members that a person is getting shipped from one state to another. That's no. that's what I'm hearing. No, I was. I, like I told you, I've been to eight different federal prisons, man. And uh, I was in Florida. I was in Maryland. I was in, uh, you know. Uh, Different other, different various states. So that's normal for the federal prison system. They, they, they send you. And that's, that's right there. That's, you know, it's, it's, it's mentally disturbing to a person that has a son, that has a grandmother that can't travel, or people that can't afford to travel. That's really harsh on the family and, and loved ones. You know, where I know some people that they haven't had a visit in five to 10 years because they stuck somewhere in California. Louisiana or somewhere, you know, and they might be from New York or, you know, New Jersey, you know, or Alabama, and they all the way in New York or somebody in California that's all the way in Connecticut, 
you know, and, and the prison system, you know, holds 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 on to them for a certain amount of years until they get a transfer. Yeah, it's sad. We have kids in our program who haven't seen their parents in five and seven years because they in New York City or the Bronx and their parents is locked away in Arizona somewhere. And so um, it's really bad, really bad. Is is there a um, a list, a focused list that we could make, Senator, so we can start attacking these as as it relates to laws, art detecting laws? You have to separate it, Dave, because one minute you're talking about the state, right? And in, in, in the instance, I'm talking about the BOP, the federal government. Well, the, the, so those the, are two different systems. Well, the model for me, from what I understand from the senator, is if they see it done well in a state then it could become done federally. Well, me, I've I, I done time in the state and I've done time in the federal system. The, the state system, to me, gives you better medical care. It gives you better, um, you know, uh, food choices as far as the commissary and everything. The federal system fails you a great deal. They fail you on medical and um uh, 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 diet, as far as you know, with the commissary and everything. <coughs> because it's what? easy to have focused advocacy, and we're proving the point that I was making by these questions. I just want everybody to know that it's easy to have focused advocacy at the state level to pressure the state government to exercise due diligence, due process, and accountability over those it's incarcerating than it is at the federal level. Right. Right? And so there are focused actions that you can do, but um, among those focused actions, being, being aware of where the opportunities are around legislation, being aware of where the opportunities are around advocacy are necessary because then that's going to create a pressure, a political pressure, and you can create a financial pressure um, to actually tip the scale or to tip yourself into change. Right. Yeah. Understand. Understand. And, to, and to that added pressure, I think it's, you know, figuring out who are the operators of these facilities, right? And figure out who are those shareholders of those facilities. And if it is need be, you put pressure on, on those right. entities as well. Who's, who's investing? That's what, it, that's what it's gonna take, that right there. Who's investing in these places? Guys, who's investing? You know, I heard, I, heard, I heard a long time ago, Nike was doing investments in jails. You know, I don't know how true that is or not, but that's something that I heard. You know what I mean? There's big corporations that are investing on the low. Because again, it's one of the most stable things to invest in if you're a big corporation. You know, I think you know. I I, I definitely want to take the time out to thank Dane for giving this platform on this subject because this is something that you know I sat back in the TV room for a while and uh, prayed for just for somebody to care about the guys that's inside. You know, and and a lot of guys that's inside. They're human. They have families. They have loved ones. They have kids. You know, they're, they're, it's, it's a lot of great people inside. And then there's some that's, that needs to be inside. But they still should be treated as equal human beings. They still deserve to be treated. Hey, right. they should, should be treated as equal. Well, anybody, human what time beings, is it? You know, and, and, and it's a shame that, uh -huh. you know, that hasn't happened. What know, time? What don't happen. It's a shame that don't I can't. happen. I can't. You know, and I like to thank everyone for taking that interest and uh, fighting for the people inside. Because trust me, if they could be watching this, and I know some of them may be watching this, because now you have cell phones and every prison. Oh, yeah, they are. You know, you have, and, and I like to shout out all of them, all around the system. And, and, you know, tell them don't give up, you know, stay strong and fight, you know, because they're going through a terrible time right now. And you know, and like I said, I like to commend and thank everyone for taking this interest, um, you know, with this subject. Because, um, you know, it shows that people do care, you know, and, and, and I'm more than sure if they could reach out to every one of the last of you, they will show their appreciation. 
I think also it's a it's it's something of, of what I like to think of as the full circle. And the full circle, and this is how we once can win more people. Full circle is doing everything uh, to for people not to enter prison. Then for everybody to understand that you could end up in prison. If you do end up in prison, you want to be treated as a human being. And then you being in prison, you don't want your time to decimate you. You want your time to give you hope of life after time. So it's telling the full story. And, and once again, it's only when you tell the full, full story that people can have empathy. Because right now, uh, you know, there's so much that's, that's, that's I, hey, I know people locked up, but I haven't heard what I heard today, listening to Mr. Phillips and Mr. Stevens. So there's a whole story that needs to get out. There's a whole story that needs to, uh, to get out. But with that story getting out, you you take it from its infancy. Its infancy, uh, how did I end up in prison? So if I ended up in prison, you have other people right now who are on the same path, having these same struggles, trying to make these same ends meet, and they can end up in the same place, but then this affects their family. But once they're there, they should still be treated as a human being. They should be given um, uh, food that is healthy. Uh, they should be given health care. So that once again, when they re-enter uh, society, um, they can be an added benefit and not re-entering because of anger, revenge, or, or some other method. But the whole story, and once the whole story is told, once a police officer or correction officer can understand, hey, one day you can end up in jail. Uh, especially uh, once we, we we begin to evaluate police officers and correction officers outside of their own society. In other words, they can't police themselves. They can't judge themselves. They need someone outside of, of their profession to do this adequately. And it's only then there's accountability. And wherever there's accountability, there's price in doing wrong. Wherever there's accountability, you have to take into uh, conscious your actions before you do it. And that's, uh, I think, where the power is. And us telling that full story, you win everybody. Yes. You, you, you win everybody, you know? Uh, I mean, you, you win everybody. Because there's some people who never thought they would be in, 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 in the prison system ended up. I know with me, uh, 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 the greatest things that put me in the prison system uh, or would is somebody calling the police on me. Two, I never got along with family court. I get I, I, I get upset when I have somebody who's not of my family telling me how to run my family, you know? And I was threatened to be locked up because I didn't want to sign a paper with my step -word. But the thing is, I don't have no authority to sign it because it's between my wife uh, my stepdaughter and her father. But here is, I'm being threatened. If I don't sign a piece of paper, the judge is going to lock me up. So I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to sign it. And my wife's like, come on, you're locked up. But the thing is, I could have easily been in jail and would have been there a while because I'm, I'm a person of ethics. I'm not going to agree to something that, that, that I'm not guilty of. But it's when, once you tell the full story, when people feel like I could be there, then you can get empathy, then you can get change. Mm. That's pretty, pretty my, much what I was going to say. My the God. power of narrative. Numbers are one thing. Data is one thing. But hearing the voice and the lived experience of, of Brother Farris, hearing the wisdom of Brother Terrence to be able to say um, one of the most powerful things you said tonight was a, about teaching children of incarcerated parents. Your parents still cares for you. Your parent wants to ensure that you're in a program where you're getting nurtured and cultivated because if you don't do that, you just put that child back in that vicious cycle of being exposed to trauma and then being uh, more likely to engage in activity that can land them in the same place, right? And so it's that power, to, that power of narrative and storytelling which you package and you take to the powers that be and you cause them not to be able to look away. When I was in Baltimore, when we were fighting to change something called alcohol outlet density, what that means is the number of alcohol stores that can be in a neighborhood, which is zoned by the population, but somehow in black and brown,
brown neighborhoods, you get more alcohol stores than are zoned for the population. We, we went to the city council. We went to the zoning and the planning board. The most powerful thing were the voices of the children. We gave them cameras. We said, take a picture on your walk to school and show them how many liquor stores you encountered. Show them all the police activity around those liquor stores. And then we're going to put you in front of the commission and you're going to speak. That's speaking to power. Right? That's having a strategy. That's having an agenda. That's having a plan. That's elevating and amplifying the voice. And that's holding powers that be accountable. And we as a people, we at black and brown, we as a society, we have to we have to be versed in that. We have to be versed because others have access to that understanding and they're using it to their benefit. I think Terrence Stevens program is one of the best programs that um that I've, I, that I've experienced and that I have firsthand experience because like I said, my son went through the program and I definitely believe, you know, through that program, my son seen who I really was because when he was at that program, the tutoring that he received and the letters that I received from him through that program was remarkable, it was unbelievable, you know, and, and, and that lets that let me know that he was in the right hands. And I used to call Mr. Stevens several times a week to thank him for taking interest in my son and for uh, just for caring for him, helping him finish school, helping him get through school at a hard time that he was going through, and just helping him keep himself motivated to see that the streets was not who he was. And, um, you know, he successfully completed the program. And uh, like I said, I owe Mr. Stevens a great deal of respect and, and love for that nurture of my son. Hey, Mr. Stevens, can you uh, share, Are you do you receive any support from the state uh, or the federal government for your program? Well, we, we receive in-kind space at the CUNY School of Medicine, and um, COVID-19 have impacted the program uh, in a devastating way. You know, we wasn't really prepared to shut all of our services down, and we was in the midst of, of developing additional funding when COVID-19 hit. So we went from being understaffed and underfunded to being wiped out of our university program site. And so now we're restructuring our, our development uh, process because um, I would like to thank, you know, Dane for giving us this platform as well because it, 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 it as a means of, of providing insight um, to some of the trauma and things that these kids are going through. But we are in the process of regrouping and trying to strengthen our development work network and I've been carrying the foundation on my back for like the last four years and uh, you know I'm virtually paralyzed from the neck down myself and it like they say it takes a village to raise a child it also takes a village and a strong team to continue to grow an organization to impact these kids of incarcerated uh, parents but uh, we've been doing a great job you know thanks to the, the in-kind uh, services of the uh, CUNY School of Medicine and the genius of the pre-med students who have been exposing these kids to STEM, coding, and tutoring them free of charge. And it's just been a great thing. Without the university help, there's no way I would have been able to even stand this, this long with respect to providing service, you know, single-handedly the way we've been going. And so um, I, I'm very thankful uh, for Farris for staying in touch with the program. Uh, right now, uh, he's on our development team. You know, he's been out uh, about 15, 20 days, and he has opened so many doors for the organization that I'm uh, very thankful for him. And one of the things that really impressed me with Farris was, in spite of being traumatized and being subjected to all the harshness that uh, Farris had to go through, he still continued to effectively be a parent from behind the walls. And I take my hat off to him. You know, I commend him um, for being such a strong individual. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Likewise, I commend, I commend all of y'all. That's uh, 
that's showing this example, you know, to the to the rest of us, especially the youth. One of the things that I uh, try to, you know, accomplish in therapy is uh, helping my clients see the agency and what they're doing. You know, the control. You know, Dr. Chris, you, uh, you you talked about that. I think a lot of times what happens to us in our community is they 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 have this mental thing on us where we don't have control, and we start thinking that we don't have control either, inside and out. You know, so one of the things I try to do in therapy is to restore that sense of agency that they can control them their, their environments you know even on the inside like you like like with, with fair of being a parent you know you brought that up mr stevens about uh him being a parent from the inside that is so important that is so so important you know and and realizing that even from the inside you can also have agency you know on the outside you can have agency it's so the so kids, important the kids need that that guidance from you know outside organization because a lot of the kids are so angry they're so traumatized uh as a result of not having access to their parent you know i, I have to actually talk kids out of them being so angry and frustrated with their parents you know well my mommy did that for me lately or my dad ain't doing this or my dad and they don't understand that you know their met their parents that's the cost of racing they, they fighting a whole level fight outside of trying to be a parent, they actually trying to survive, you know? And that's why when we do workshops and we go on field trips, we have to write thank you letters to their parent to try to to try to try ease some of that trauma that the kids are suffering. And it's also showing the kids that, you know, through, through trying situations that they can still keep their sense of agency <coughs> and still transform the environment around them. And that's, you know, that's the message that we need to spread. You know, to everybody. So, you know, congratulations on your example. You know, uh, I can relate to it. Believe me. Absolutely, absolutely. My nurse, my nurse is here. I hate to cut this short, but I have to take my treatment. My nurse is here, so um, I want to thank you guys for having me, Dame. I, I want to thank you for this platform, Ferris. Yeah, I want to thank you for what you. you're doing, bro. And thank I you. Definitely look forward to. Nurturing our relationship a day. We need somebody like you on our board, my brother. I'm somebody here. Somebody with some real leadership, my brother. That's not a bait that pavement. I'm so here, I'm bro. I'm excited. I'm definitely excited. I wanted to continue this conversation. Um, and uh, hopefully we can we can remain in touch. And Ferris, thank you so much for your support. I know we're going to do great things. And uh, thank you all. And I have to go to the street. And my nurse is here. Thank you, right, bro. Guys. I'll talk to you later. God bless, brother. Hey, all right. Hey, all right, thank you. Senator? God bless. I, I felt like we were all doing closing, so, Senator? This has been powerful. You know, every time I, I get to get around everybody on this call, you know, I get inspired uh, to try to do more and learn more mm-hmm. to figure out what I can do to impact my community. I know I'm not in, in, in the states that you guys are in, but trust me, we have some of the same issues, same concerns that impact my community. So, you know, I, I forever appreciate you all. Brother Ferris, man, you are a, an inspiration, man. You know, I, I have family members that's locked up right now, uh, both fit in time and doing, dealing with the state. Right. And they're not in this particular state and, and I'm my wheels are turning and I'm like what can I do to help them or what can I do to touch my colleagues in those other states so to what Dane was saying earlier in terms about being about that action it's like and a doc mentioned this too I'm, I'm thinking outside of just the policy piece right the, the legislative piece that's a that's a part of it but consistent advocacy yeah, I know we have our ACLUs of, of the world, but I think on a grassroots level, it's more consistent agitation uh, for those that are in, that have resources and influence and access. So it's how do we get folks connected to tell that story? Uh, how do we identify folks when they return home to provide those support services for them, uh, be it mental health treatment or whatever the case may be. So this has opened my eyes a lot more than, than ever before dealing with uh, criminal overall criminal justice reform that we talk about. 
and we got to move past the cliche terms of just saying criminal justice reform. And I'm saying this broadly and holistically. I hear this in the state house. I hear this everywhere on different forms and platforms. We say criminal justice reform, overhaul it, break it down. But I don't see the actions. I don't see the, the, the momentum. And I think conversations like this, connecting with the right players in other communities and states, and developing the strategy and moving forward. So I hope this is not the last time we had this conversation. I'm here. I'm I'm here for life. I'm I'm here to the day I die to fight for what's right, and um, I'll do anything I can and try to be any way I can be to fight for what's right, especially through a system like that. So if there's any need of me, if you need me in any way, uh, you can reach out to Dane. Uh, he knows how to get in touch with me, or if you want another, I can. Make sure you have my number or whatever. But if there's anything I can do, it's done. Consider it done, like without without a question. You know, just say, "Hey, brother, I need you," and I'm there. So uh, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here for the people. I'm here for what's right. You know. So you know, like I said, I commend everybody for caring, and I like to thank everybody again for caring and reaching out and using this time talk about the subjects that we need to be talking about. So, like I said, I'm humble and I appreciate everybody for uh, taking their time out to discuss these matters. And I feel um, I feel like we all need to come together. I mean, whether it's your friends, your colleagues, all of us have friends and colleagues. I have over 10 to 15 friends that did over 25 years. You know, and um, I know if I call on each and every one of them, They'll be there to step up and talk and, you know, give their outlook on what's going on or, you know, what their experience in the system, you know. And like I said, I thank everybody. Thank you, brother, for taking the time out to, um, you know, understand, you know, what, you know, people is going through. Not just me, but there's so many other people like me in this system that just want to be respected and want to be cared for. I want to be treated as a human, you know. So I'm willing to fight for those people, you know. That's all right. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you. No question. So you know, um, in knowing Fayback, I was always kind of wanting to meet Farris. I was intrigued, you know. I wanted to know what kind of guy, like, how did he raise him so well? And uh, when we first spoke, I wasn't anticipating his spirit for fighting for other people, like his concern for others before himself. And it's sort of the same spirit that we all have on this Zoom. Um, you know, none of us are doing this for money. It's all for love, you know? And it's like, we feel other people's pain. You know, not many people that are strong enough that are cut from a certain cloth still care, you know? But also, it's not about only bringing awareness. You know, everyone on here is about that action. Fully commits to whatever they believe in, wholeheartedly, 100%. And so well-spoken, everybody. So this was a conversation, because the intention, after speaking with Farris, is for him to be able to have and bring awareness and for us to evolve and make changes on a consistent level, not to speak about it once, but for us to have another conversation and we could say, since we've spoke, we've done this. You know, just like every time I speak to the senator, he's like, oh yeah, since I spoke to Farris, I done been trying to get to the jail and I already did all this, that, and the third, and the research. We all got to do that. And we all have to come back with a plan. And my attitude is, they're not going to help us I'm not going to complain so much about it. I just feel like we have to figure out, and it won't happen overnight, but how to dissect this thing from the therapy to the health to the economic empowerment to the kids, you know, to, every, to the CEOs, to the judges, to every single part of rehabilitation curated by us so that we're not waiting for them to give us a plan. We can give them a plan or we can do the plan ourselves 
but it's always coming from an authentic place. You know? And, and that's power. And I appreciate all of you for always taking me serious and always bringing so much to the table. I learned a lot today. And I have friends that are in jail and been with them for decades. And I still didn't realize it was that bad. You know why? Because when you speak to them, they're not going to complain. They don't want you to feel their pain. I've never right. once heard my friend, yo, I just saw a rat. I never heard him say that. That's right. That's right. And, and that's one of the reasons um, that a lot of people is not aware of what goes on. Because there's plenty of times that I was going through hell. But I never shared that with my son, my aunt, my brothers, my sisters, my attorneys. No one. I kept that to myself because in my mind, I was thinking this is normal. This is the norm of the prison system. In actuality, it wasn't the norm. You're not supposed to be going through things like this in the prison system. But for me not to inflict pain on my, my family and, 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 and my friends, when they would call, I would, when I, when I would call, I would tell them, they would be like, hey, what's up, what's going on? I would uplift my spirits when really my spirits was down, but I would uplift them so they won't have to worry. But really, I'm going through this, I'm going through that. But I've never been a person that complains. And I've never been a person that cried about my conditions because my conditions in life was always at a worse. So that was a norm to me. But when I entered the system, it shouldn't have been a norm. It shouldn't have been a norm. It shouldn't have been, I, I, I shouldn't have been able to, I should have been able to have clean sheets or a clean environment to live in. Because this is what funding gets you. But when you're not getting those things, where's the funding going? I never, what, what, what they buy, basketballs or TV? That's the only thing I've seen in the system that they, 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 the funding go to. They don't give out soap. I mean, they just recently started giving out soap somewhat because of the pandemic. But other than that, they don't give you nothing else. If you don't have no soap to wash with, you're not getting none. If nobody gives you some soap or deodorant, you're not getting one. You know, so, so the, to me, the system is totally broke. It's totally broke. It's totally broke. It's 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 just a shame, man. And you know, before I close out, I would definitely like to thank my both my attorneys and my investigator, Anthony Rico and Peter Keanu and Frank Gonzalez. Because they was my truly blessings of getting me out of an environment that I could have been subject to dying after all the years that I served. So I would definitely like to thank them and uh, show my appreciation to all my family and my friends that helped me through this long process. Y'all never let me down, and I thank you, and I love y'all all. All right. And, you know, big shout out to Kev Childs and Don Diva Magazine, Fayback, <laughs> everyone that, again, was on this panel, always there for me, always teaching me. And, you know, there's some things, other things we have to do. So again, instead of just talking about it, break these things down one by one. We'll play a little checkers, but we'll also play chess. It won't happen overnight. And we all have to understand therapeutically, this shit is broke on purpose. It's intentional. Mm -hmm. And they're not gonna fix it. It's meant to control and program us for us to be slaves and not even know it. You know, to be conditioned to be slaves and not even know it, for that to be our normal. And that's gonna change. It's the perfect time for it. And I'm embracing that. So I'm, I'm happy about it. I'm looking for the right fight, and this is one of them. And all of y'all are just looking for the right fight. All of y'all looking for the fight. Every one of y'all looking for the fight. The right fight. And I appreciate y'all. Hopefully we can continue to do this. Actually, we will. And we will come back with some results. I appreciate you, Ferris. I appreciate you being so gracious with your story, so transparent about your emotion and everything you went through, you know, and then just raising of such a balanced child. I personally knew him, you know, for a while and he's such a consistent, good, good dude. He gets, he's like in the good dude character category. 
you know, and that's a proper reflection of the man is his children, you know, so I appreciate you for that. Great job. Thank you, everybody. You'll see this on Dame Dad Studios. It's important, so you'll be able to check it out. And also, we have the 24-hour happening thing, thing happening on, um, on uh, the app now. And I'll also like to do a screening with all of y'all at some point. You know, I'm going to do a Yard Squad one. The Senator, we're going to do one with uh, Carlton's story from the lynch mob for OG stories. I appreciate y'all. It's going to open up a lot of dialogue. Thank you. Never And, and, and Dr. Chris, I mean, well, who are you? Gosh, whew. You are ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to say, Senator, I put in the chat box um, the legislature to know what's going on. Okay? You see? Okay. It? Got it. All right. Thank you. All right, y'all. Love y'all. This is my Goodbye. God bless. Thanks again. Hey, Nicolette. Yeah. Look it up. Yeah. That was great. Great job, y'all. That was fly. Um, you recorded? You were the... Uh...